Get up, go to work, and make something out of your life. We have lost all sense of community in this country. They said to her, what's the baby's name? She says, Mattress Mac. Gallery furniture will save you money. I learned how to gamble when I was in the Catholic school and just kept on. Now it's a little higher level. I bet 75 million on the Astros to win the World Series. We ended up selling about $76 million worth of mattresses. Boss walked in and said, son, I got news for you. So I'm thinking to myself, what's the news? A raise or promotion? What's it going to do for me? He says, is your fire? And I said, oh. Setback's just a setup for comeback. He said, I moved to Houston. I'll get in a furniture business with you. But you're going to have to marry me first. I thought to myself, where else can I get an employee this cheap? And we moved to Houston. Work is life's greatest therapy. Tough times never last. Tough people do. Just when it's too tough for you boys, just about right for me. I'm going to retire right up to the front desk, and I'm going to die right there, and I'm going to die happy. All right, the legendary Mattress Mac is coming up. I'm excited to share this conversation. But first, I want you to place a bet on Dad Saves America. Subscribe to the channel, like this video, leave a comment. Let YouTube know that you and everyone out there wants to see more of what we're doing every week. Mac, welcome to Dad Saves America. Dad Saves America, great title. <laughs> Glad you like it. I love it. <laughs> okay, so I want to start off. I'm dealing with something like that right now, as a matter of fact. <laughs> I want to hear all about that. Uh -huh. Okay, first off, you are a betting man. So tell me about this Astros bet. How much money are we talking about? Give me the full story on this. Well, the big story was the Astros bet last year, and I bet um, cumulatively about $75 million on the Astros to win the World Series, and... Uh, the deal is customers come in and buy a mattress 3,000 plus, Astros win, you get your money back. And because they went all the way to the World Series last year, the business the last two weeks was off the charts. So we ended up selling about $76 million worth of mattresses, and we had $75 million in uh, uh, betting uh, insurance. And so uh, the customers were thrilled, we were happy, it was a great promotion. And doing it again this year, we'll see how it works. So where did you come up with this idea to bet? I mean, this is a massive amount of money to bet on a game. Is this the, is this, are these the biggest bets in all of sports betting? The biggest future bets in sports history. I started out really small many years ago when the Cowboys played the Texans. It says if the, uh, the Texans were huge underdogs in the first time they'd ever met in a regular NFL game. So if the Texans went against the Cowboys, you get your money back. And way back then, we did a million five on that. I didn't insure it. And at halftime, the Texans were ahead by about 14 points. And so I was going to be out of all my money. But the uh, Texans ended up losing. So that's how I started it. And it's grown since then. Is this for fun? Is it all marketing? You said it's like, man, it drives it drives this marketing sales. drives tremendous traffic. You know, after the Astros yesterday, Traded for Justin Verlander. A lot of people came in last night buying mattresses. So, and then uh, my friend from Valdez threw a no hitter last night. So that'll drive some more business. So it's about business. It's also about the Houston Astros. And you know, I've been to a lot of community events in this town, probably thousands over the years. Nothing draws people better together than uh, all races, colors, creeds, ethnicities, ages in the Houston Astros. They're a great community builder. We're here in Houston, Texas. Right. I understand this is one of the most diverse cities in the whole country. Uh -huh, it is. So when you say that, it really yeah, it means just, a lot. If, if you go walk, walk the concourse at the Minute Maid Park, you'll see what I'm talking about. So let's. how did you go from a kid to betting $75 million on Astros games, which is like a kid's, the kids don't even dream that big. Well, so, when, I, when I was a, a kid, I went to Catholic school and they had uh, bazaars and bingos and raffles, so they yeah. taught me how to gamble. And uh, <laughs> during uh, my high school years, me and several of the other guys went to high school with at the Catholic school would play cards. So I learned how to gamble when I was in the Catholic school and just kept on. Now it's a little higher level. You know, I went to 12 years of Catholic school and somehow I missed that lesson. You missed so. that part, I didn't. <laughs> I got an A in it. Where'd you get the name Mattress Mac? How'd that start? How'd that come about? Got down here, started selling furniture in 1981. Business has always been, you know, a challenge, and marketing's a challenge. I read a book about a guy in West Texas who was a tire salesman, and sales were horrible. 
And so for some reason, he started wearing a tire around himself wherever he went to the PTA meeting, the Little League games, the church, whatever, and became known as a tire man, and he sold a ton of tires. So I figured if he could be a tire man, I could be Mattress Max. So I started wearing a mattress years ago and did it in television ads, and I still go by the name Mattress Max. So it's a good name because that's what we do. We sell lots of mattresses. The, um, how did you, how'd you get started? So I understand that you, you, uh, you had five grand in your pocket, and you had a could be or would, would eventually be wife. Yeah. So how do you how do you go from girlfriend and five grand to starting a business? Well, I was I was in Dallas and I, I was working at a convenience store and I had a bad attitude. I didn't like it. I'd been a failure at a couple of businesses before, blah, blah, blah. And one night the uh, boss walked in and said, son, I got news for you. So I'm thinking to myself, What's the news? A raise or promotion? What's it going to do for me? I said, sure, that's great. What's the news? He says, you're fired. And I said, oh, oh no. And I went home at night and went into a, a really uh, clinical depression for several weeks. I felt sorry for myself. I felt like I was a victim of circumstances. I felt like uh, the world had, uh, had it in for me. How old are you at this point? I was probably 26 years old, 27, something like that, maybe 25. And then I turned on the television one Sunday morning. I was at church going Catholic. It said didn't watch much television on church, but Oral Roberts was there, a famous television evangelist, and he was preaching a, a message that day. And the message was that the greatest challenge that we all have, my creator, is to use our talents. He said, get up, go to work, and make something out of your life. And that was a seminal event in my life. I remember it like yesterday. He said, get up, go to work, and make something out of your life. So I went out the next day and I got a job at a small furniture store there in Dallas. And the problem was the furniture store was located about 50 miles from my parents' house and I had no car. We know I learned in business and life you do what you have to do and you don't pay the price, you enjoy the price. So I rode the bus two hours out there every day, rode it two hours back. Yeah. I began to read these self-help books like Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, The Clad Magic of Believing by Claude Bristol. And reprogram my stinking thinking and after a couple of years I decided I want to be an entrepreneur and I have my own furniture store. I didn't want to put a furniture up there in Dallas to meet with my boss because he'd been very good to me and I was loyal to him. So I asked him one day in late 1980 where it'd be a good place to start a furniture store somewhere in Texas other than Dallas. He said Houston. So I called my brother up who was in the real estate business down here in Houston at that time. I told him to find me a location. After four or five weeks he called me up and got me a little location. I was all excited. So I went out to dinner the night with Linda, my girlfriend. I said, Linda, I got great news for you tonight. She said, what's that, Mac? I said, we're going to move to Houston when we get in the furniture business. She said, there ain't no way. <laughs> and I said, Linda, you don't understand something. We're going to move to Houston to get in the furniture business. If you just might do well, we might be successful. She said, look, Mac, you don't understand something. I said, what's that? She said, all my uh, friends live here in Dallas. We're at school here. we got a good job. My parents live here. Uh, I'm not moving to Houston to get in the furniture business. Well, I had learned if you're going to be successful in business and life, above all, you have to be persistent. So I kept asking and asking her. Finally, about 11 o'clock, I asked her about the 40 times. She got very frustrated with me. She slammed her hand there on the dashboard. said, I'll tell you what, Mac. She said, I moved to Houston. I'll get in the furniture business with you. But you're going to have to marry me first. And uh, Seems like a fair trade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I thought to myself, uh, this woman has put me on a difficult decision. And then I came up with an entrepreneurial brainstorm. I thought to myself, where else can I get an employee this cheap? And we moved to Houston. <laughs> Yeah. We yeah. got married and moved to Houston. And I always thought we came in here with $5,000. She corrected me a couple months ago, and we came in here with 3600 bucks and a dream. So uh, how, how do you have 3600 bucks mm -hmm. and say, I'm going to start a store and get a location? And, you well, know, we had the location, which was right but here. But how do you pay and, for it? Like, uh, for, for that young person? They, they, they kind of let us move in with probably a $500 deposit. And... Uh, Linda and I slept at the store for the first six months, kind of like I'm doing now in the, in the tower, a little different. But we slept here because we couldn't afford having anybody steal our inventory. And uh, we invented same-day delivery in the furniture business because we couldn't afford to have anybody cancel it. We, we'd had no, we had no money. So I would sell the furniture, Linda, and another guy would put a load in the back of this red pickup truck. They'd follow the customer home, and there we went. Many a Saturday night, we'd sell out of furniture because we had very little inventory, and we had a U-Haul truck. I would drive it to Dallas, meet my friend at his store, take the $10,000 we made on sales that Saturday, pay for furniture, drive it back down, and sell it on Sunday. This is one of these things that I think people don't appreciate about when, you, when you're running a business is that you have to spend a lot of money before any money comes in, and that just keeps going. Yeah. It, it's like, it never know. ends, yeah. 
and you've got inventory, right? So you're you're buying everything in this store, and then you're making a bet that people are gonna. Yeah, take we're it betting off your hands. that people in. No matter who you are, 40% of the inventory you buy doesn't sell, so you gotta mark it down and move it out. But you know that's retailing, and I've been at retailing for 42 years of my life, and uh, you know at this point I'm pretty good at it, and we've got a tremendous base of great customers. We've got two things in common. So I had a long commute into New York City every day. I moved down to Texas about 10 years ago. Did you? And I, I, I dug into books and it changed my life on that. Good for you. On that, um, on that commute. And I work with my wife. I actually met her at work and we've worked together ever Good for since. You. That's great. How, what's your advice for working with, with your spouse? You know, you both got to be on the same page. And uh, Linda raised the kids and I worked 100 hours a week. And, you know, she never once whined or complained or said, why don't you come home? But she knew I was trying to make a life for ourself, our family, and our uh, team members, employees. So, you know, you got to be on the same page. And uh, if, if the wife or husband is going opposite direction, it'll never work. So take me to that moment where you, you decide, I have to make start advertising. What was going on with the business? Were you struggling? Was it like Yeah, the first two years we did pretty well because oil and gas was booming in Houston, 81, 82. Then 83, the recession hit and the price of oil plummeted. And I knew we had, we had to start advertising to get people in here. So I took the last $10,000 I had and I uh, rented that little TV studio in North Houston and went up there one Friday night after work trying to do a commercial. And I who wrote the script? I did, you know, and so I'm, I couldn't come up with a punchline in the ad. So finally, at the end of the ad, I said, a gallery French really will save you money. And the producer said, that's enough, let's go home. But that, that ad stuck, and that was our tagline for 20, 30 years. Did you embrace, because you, you go big when you do that yeah. tagline. Uh -huh. Was that something where you're like, I got to go big, I got to I grew, up, I grew up in Dallas watching a guy named Art Grendel sell cars. He was a wild man. He'd jump on top of the cars and scream, and I want to sell you a car and this and that. So I, I promised myself if I ever got on television, I would mimic Art Grendel, and, and it seemed to work. I grew up watching Crazy Eddie. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so same, same yeah, kind of deal. Crazy Eddie was kind of going out when I was ascending. I, uh, I understand that the University of Houston marketing department gave you quite the honor for your advertising. Is that right? I can't remember all that. They probably said I'd never survive, but uh, you know I was too persistent not to, not to survive, yeah. and so was Linda. We were going to make it work, and uh, one of my models has always been late to bed, early to rise, work like hell, and advertise. So you got to let people know who you are and where you're at and what you have to offer. Yeah, they. Uh, I was reading an article before we got started and said that you, you your ads were rated by the, this you know university like the worst ads in Houston, but I think they're memorable. That's let's put it that way. <laughs> they may be bad, but the idea was you know to break break through the clutter. It still is. Well, you know it's funny. I read um, Ogilvy on advertising, and he was a creative director, uh -huh. writer, but he he used to put creative in quotes. And he's like your job is to move product, yeah. right? Good so I, him, yeah. I think the marketing department at the university probably needs to get right with what the point is, maybe. <laughs> now, traditionally, it's, traditionally, my advertising sucks, but <laughs> um, the, from a pragmatic point of view, it works pretty good. Did your dad give you any inspiration for starting a business? Where did you get this entrepreneur? That's under inspiration. My, uh, my father was a lifelong entrepreneur. He was in the insurance business, and he was... Uh, Tremendously successful several times, had a couple big failures, but he was always an inspiration to me and my uh, two brothers and three sisters or six of us. And uh, he and my mother would not have thought about taking a vacation without us in a thousand years. Their whole life revolved around uh, family and church and community and him running those businesses and uh, just a tremendous inspiration of uh, work ethic, never give up, salesmanship, entrepreneurism, everything was kind of rolled in the package. When you were at that low point, did, and you know, you get laid off from this, you mm. get fired, mm. and you're at home, did your dad have anything to tell you that, that was helpful? I mean, yeah, he always told me never give up, you know, and he lived his life that way. He had several big time failures in business because things didn't go his way, and he was in a very a risky business of insuring mobile homes down on the Gulf Coast with hurricanes everywhere. And when some of the oh, big, wow. big hurricanes hit, it was devastating to his business. 
but always got up, always went to work, always went to church, always cared for the kids. You know, we'd play football games. I played football in Tex at the University of Texas. My brother did too. My brother, other brother played at LSU. And he, he, my father was petrified to fly. He'd drive all the way across the country just to watch us play a football game. He never missed a kid's activity. Tell me about your family, your kids. You know, James, my oldest son, uh, was uh, born, I think, the second year we were in business. And then uh, Laura and Liz, and then we have two adopted children. So. We've got five great kids. I think I overheard, are you planning to adopt again? Is that, did I, did I hear that right? You know, there's a, there's a uh, young man that has been, uh, he started calling me a couple years ago when he was eight years old on my cell phone, and my cell phone's on the website. So uh, he's a good kid, and uh, he's in a very tough family situation right now. So uh, I sent him to a basketball game last night, and after the basketball game, he says to me, Mr. Mack, should I bring my clothes tomorrow? So, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? We're, we're trying to help him, help his brother, and help his mother, who <clears throat> is in a tough situation. You're a big part of this community. Mm -hmm. You know, you're really engaged. Did your dad did, did the same? Was he, was he somebody that was plugged Absolutely. in? Did he, he model was, that? He was engaged beyond he used to sponsor the Little League baseball teams. I'll never forget one of these parents saying to him, you only sponsor the team because your kids play. He said, no, I sponsor the team because everybody is there. He started the Catholic high school. I went to Bishop Lynch High School in 1963. He was one of the first five funders of that high school. And my father was a giver till, till, uh, till he bled. And he would give when he didn't have money to give. I'll never forget a story. A uh, guy that played quarterback at the high school was two years ahead of me. And uh, my father helped me get a full football scholarship at Dartmouth, you know, and the wow. guy was real bright, good bright, Ivy League school. So uh, Jim, the guy, went up there to um, school the first semester of his freshman year, and then he came back to Dallas for uh, Christmas break. He had no money to get back up there, and he was going to have to drop out of Dartmouth College, which was a great opportunity for him. My father put him in the car and drove him all the way up there. And with no doubt about it. How old were you when that, when those lessons started to really resonate with you? 17, 18, 19, you know. So it was, you were, you were really feeling this is, yeah. this is important this for is, life. This is a desired behavior. This is, you know, what you should do. Did I always live up to it? Of course I didn't. But, you know, he was consistent. My mother was consistent. My mother was an incredible um, Catholic and incredible. Her job was a housewife and raising us six kids. And, her work ethic was incredible. My father's enthusiasm and entrepreneurism was uh, infectious, and uh, both of them cared deeply about the community and uh, taught me what values that I have I got from them. So when your son was born, you're only two years into this business, you've moved to a new city, you've got it all on the line. You know, these days, people say, well, I'm not ready to have kids, I have to wait, and people are waiting until their 30s. You know, so w what was that like for you? Uh, you know, why did you have have a kid so early when you're just starting a business, and how did it change the way you interacted with you know your well, ambitions? Well, you know, I, James uh, was a, a wonderful addition to our life, and uh, uh, we always wanted the child, so we were th uh, thrilled to have him there. And and then uh, watching him grow up was one of the highlights of our life. Now he works here with me and does a wonderful job, so. Couldn't be more proud of him. He's got a, a wife and four wonderful children, so a great kid. And yeah, he didn't, he learned from my leadership. I wasn't there a lot, but his mother did a great job of uh, teaching him values and virtues and principles, things like that. Did you feel your brain change at all? Did you feel like, like, did it give you, what, what did it change in you when you had your Probably son? more responsibility. And I always wanted to instill in James the, work ethic and the uh, uh, caring for people my father instilled in me, and uh, hopefully um, he's heading that direction, certainly looks like it. When did you first realize you're, you're becoming your father? <laughs> we all end up becoming our parents, right? <laughs> when did that start to happen for Pro you? Probably when I was up here sweating payroll every week. You know, I, 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 I didn't realize what he was doing, but now I can look back and see you know, the business pressures he had and this and that and the and running the family at the same time. But he always put family and uh, religion in front of business. So uh, uh, a, a tremendous lesson for me from him. 
that risk taking, not everybody's up for that. Yeah. So what do you think is it that gives you that appetite for risk? I mean, we started off the conversation talking about your big bets on, on baseball. It's but genes, you know, the, you know, we don't live in the past, but the past lives in us. And I feel like my mother's uh, father was a uh, very successful entrepreneur in northern Alabama, and I know he was a risk taker because he couldn't have been as successful as he was without taking risks. My father was always a risk taker, and risk taking is easier for me. It's just uh, it's part of it. What's I have your, a high tolerance for risk. What's your advice for the young? There's a lot of young men out there who are in the position you were in. They they they've struggled to like get their life together. Maybe they've gotten fired from a job, and they're sitting on the couch, and they're like they're shrinking. I was listening to some radio podcast the other day. Some guy wanted to be a sportscaster, so he moved to Los Angeles. And he got a little garage, you know, hole-in-the-wall apartment he could afford. And he got a job as a radio broadcaster in San Diego. So he's commuting like 100 miles each day to and from. And he did that for about 10 years. He's not making much money, but he's doing what he loves. So he's very frustrated because he doesn't he's tired of this community, he's tired of living in this small hole in the wall apartment and he's about to give it up and he calls his mother and he's complaining about all this. For the first time in his life he says, can you and dad loan me X amount of money so I can move to San Diego, get a nice apartment and not have to worry about these financial pressures every day. And the phone went dead. And so he was concerned about that. He called his mother back up and he said, the phone went dead. She said, no it didn't. He said, well what happened? She said, I, she said, I hung up on you. She said, why'd you hang up on me? She says, who told you you don't have to pay your dues? That's a missing element in this country. Why do you think that's changed? Why do you think there's this, it feels Sense like the of entitlement. culture. entitlement, you know, protecting these kids 24-7. You know, the, 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 they dress up like a football player to ride a bicycle. You know, you and I, we fell over, get scraped, our nose scraped to get back up and dust yourself off and get back in it. Everybody does it to make straight A's every day and life's full of failure. If you don't teach people how to fail, then you don't teach them how to move forward fast. Man, that, that's such a big part of what we do at this show, you know, is it, it, this sense that, like, we wrapped our kids in bubble wrap. It's crap. That, it's uh, total crap, you know? And then when, then when something bad happens, they're de devastated, you know? If not for my struggles, I would not know my strength. You know, my child, Elizabeth, when she was 13 years old, she's going to uh, Westfield High School up here. She had severe obsessive compulsive disorder and uh, she dropped out of school, couldn't handle it. So we took her to all these psychiatrists in North Houston area, and every one of them said right in front of her, she'll never get any better, put her in a mental institution for the rest of her life, forget about her. You know, well, her mother and I, we're not buyers, we're sellers, we weren't buying all that crap. So we, we searched for psychiatrists across the world, and it got so bad for two years, Linda lived upstairs with Liz because Liz was suicidal. And she screamed every night. This is your night. wife. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, Liz was suicidal. Linda uh -huh. would live up there with her. And Liz would scream every night, God, what did I do to deserve this? I wish I was dead. And then she'd get a butcher knife and beg her beloved sister to kill her every night. And it was hell on earth. But uh, awful. finally we got her to the Miniger Clinic in Topeka, Kansas. Had to kidnap her one day and take her up there. And then her worst dreams are coming true. We're going to leave her in a mental institution for the rest of her life. That wasn't the story, but that's what she thought. Right. And so we left her that day, her little face pushing up against the plate glass window, screaming at her mother, Mom, please don't leave me here. Oh. And uh, we left her there. She sat down on the couch and cried. And her little friend, Amy, who she's still friends with to this day, 20 years later, sat down and put her arm around her said, it's okay, I cried when I got here, this place saved my life. And eight weeks later, she got better, came back to Houston, re-enrolled at Westfield High School, and she uh, did well for a year and a half, then she had a relapse because mental illness is a cruel disease. No one knows who it may strike or why mental illness never goes away, it lasts forever, and my child will always be walking on the edge of a cliff. So she went back into Menager, which that time moved to Houston, and then after another six months, she got better and got out. Anyway, fast forward, she turned her pain into her purpose, and now she's one of the world's leading people in the field of OCD. She has a PhD and runs a big OCD clinic here in Houston. And, uh, you know, without that pain, she'd have never had that purpose. That's, that's this thing that, you know, it's easy to say, but until it, it's, you experience it. It's hard to do. It. You gotta live it. You know, you gotta live it. You gotta, you, you gotta cry and you gotta say, God, why, why did you choose me for this? And, you know, you got, you got to suck it up. And that's the way life is. To me, 
Life's a battle and a blessing every day. It's never going to change. And all these people think one of these days I'm going to be on easy street. Easy street never comes. You just got to get up there and suit up every day. But you know what? One day I was in Las Vegas betting on Houston Astros way back in 2017. I'm walking through this casino, afraid the Astros are going to lose. I'm going to lose all my money. And I saw this sign on the wall. It says, life offers you a second chance. It's called tomorrow. Suit up. I think I saw that somewhere around mm. in this store. This store mm. is filled yeah. with wisdom on the walls, mm. isn't it? Mm. You started off at $3,600. What's your revenue like today? Not $200 million, something like $200 that. $200 million. Mm. How many locations? Three. It's three now. And the internet site. It's unbelievable. <laughs> no, it's not unbelievable. And, you know, people ask me, could you do it today in a New York Minute? It's kind of simple. You get up earlier, you stay later, you work harder, and you try to do things that are smart, and you learn from mistakes. It's not that hard. You know, the, the opportunity is out there right now more than ever before because uh, so many people, like you said, are full of this sense of entitlement. Just go run, run circles around. I tell these kids, uh, how do I get ahead? Find a job you love to do and you'll never have to work a day in your life. Find a job you love to do. Why do you love this? What is the part that you love the most? The people the customers, you know, those are my people coming in here. Whether it's uh, helping some kid like the one you saw yesterday or uh, calling these customers back and they they, uh, they cry when they hear my voice. <laughs> they tell me they had the best night's sleep of their life. Or they tell me that their husband was coming home from uh, cancer treatment. He'd been in the hospital for six months. They'd ordered a bed from another store. The other store didn't deliver it and we delivered it in two hours and saved the day. You know, it's, it makes it worthwhile. It's yeah. about a whole lot more than money. You have, you know, and as I was reading some of the stuff, you, some of your interviews parent, preparing for this, you know, you said something that's a business uh, fact. You want to have a unique selling feature, a unique mm. selling proposition. Mm. What's yours? Same day delivery, you get it delivered in three hours. You know, in three hours. And the other unique selling feature we have is being part and parcel part of the fiber of the community. You know, you know that's something that we do. We have... Over the last 42 years, I've probably given 20,000 speeches in this town. And I can't tell you how many people come in here and say you spoke at my high school graduation back in the, in the 80s. And that sort of longevity, it, it works. When we were talking yesterday, as we were setting up the uh, cameras and everything, you pointed, you know, I, I, I grew up in, I was born in Philly and grew up in the surrounding area uh -huh. you had a fun exchange in philadelphia i bring it up so what happened tell me what tell me about what happened in philly you know we went up to philly for the astros and of course i had that 75 million dollar bet and it, it, it's not my money it's it, you know we're betting the money for the customers to win but it's a lot of money and a big big deal so it was one to one and then the astros lost game two to philly uh and so I'm walking out with the five or six guys who are up there with me, and this Philly fan was drunk. He says, hey, Mac, that effing L TV is never going to make the effing Hall of Fame, and you're an effing cheat, and he's an effing liar. And they go take those jerseys off, all the Philly, all the Astro fans, they all have buzzers on because they effing cheat. And fans. so finally I had enough, and I hurled back at him a lot of those Philly words he just taught me. And <laughs> we had a nice exchange, and it, it, and so the next morning I'm at breakfast with all these guys, and they're all whispering and handling handing their phone around, and I knew that uh, it was on YouTube or something. So I said, it ain't no big deal. And my one daughter, the one that's in the mental health field, she was petrified of the whole thing, my behavior. My other daughter, who's in the restaurant business, said, best damn thing you ever did, Dad. So it, well, it turned out to be uh, very viral. You, you know, you told me about that, so I, I looked it up on YouTube, and I found this local news story, and just talking about how embedded you are in this community it's like, first of all the newscasters are talking about you like 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 a buddy like you're clearly like a part of this community in a really deep way they also pointed out this meme gangster mac that went viral <laughs> yeah they had a hat at minute made park on seven one uh, july 13th july 13th is uh, 713 day the main area code in houston of course 713 so they had a hat, they started selling it at 7.13 in the morning, had a money sign on the front, had me with a wheelbarrow cash on the side, and on the back it said that he stood up for our boys, it was a hat about me. And they sold that hat at 7.13 day in Houston at the uh, 
Minute Maid Park where the Astros play in the sporting goods store. They sold that hat for $281 a piece. They sold uh, 500 of them. <laughs> so, okay, I want to talk about capitalism. We're sitting here. There's this awesome sign. We need freedom. Okay, I'll read it down here. We need freedom to shape our future. We need profit to remain free. Explain that to me. You know, so many people in this country don't understand that you got to make a profit to have all these things happen. And all this money the government squanders is money that uh, businesses or people made uh, through the sweat of their brow through work, you know. And if we don't make a profit out here, we can't support the community. I can't take care of these kids or I can't give their mother uh, money when they come up here. Uh, I had this uh, during the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, they deemed us an essential business, thank God. So we gave out supplies and essentials and food here for weeks and had thousands of cars coming here getting the stuff. But this woman who lives in the apartments behind us, low in an apartment complex, she's a prostitute and she was pregnant. So during her pregnancy, she'd come over here and I'd give her money for food and hopefully legal drugs and things like that. And she got to be six months pregnant, it became too much for her to handle, so she wanted me to get her in a halfway house. So I get her in a halfway house. And after about a, three or four weeks, she busted out of the halfway house, so they kicked her out because she, they wouldn't let her smoke pot there. Hmm. So she goes back to the apartment complex. She goes back to the apartment complex on Thursday. Friday morning, she comes over here, and she's been pistol whipped, and she's got ashes all over her face. It's just brutal. Ugh, her lips are all swollen. And she's pregnant, and so she wants to go back in the halfway house. Well, after you get kicked out once, they won't let you back in, but because they knew me, they let her back in on Friday. So she goes in there on Friday. She's now almost seven months pregnant. Uh, Monday morning, she has the baby at LBJ Hospital, which is a uh, state-run hospital for you know indigent population. And the doctors birthing the baby, they knew the situation, welfare mother, no husband, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So they said to her, uh, and miraculously, the baby came out clean. Mom had HIV, she had AIDS, she had heroin, cocaine in her system, marijuana, all this, and the baby's clean, miracle. So they said to her. And well, early, right? Because it's like seven yeah, months. Seven months, months, too yeah. much premature. They said to her, what's the baby's name? She says, Mattress Mac. <laughs> the doctor's <laughs> eyes got like this big. So when we adopted, uh, I got her to get the child up for adoption. And here now we have, after during the pandemic, we figured out we could do more sales with less inventory. We didn't need this vast selection. So we, t I went to a micro program that was called Dirty Jobs. You know, oh, we yeah. talked about yep. Dirty yep. Jobs. I decided to set up with my friend Mike Feinberg a trade school where you could teach the skilled trades to people for nothing like plumbing, electrical, HVAC, construction skills, auto mechanics. We also started a high school for kids 16 to 26, never finished high school. And we started a preschool for kids uh, six months, five years old, our team members, kids, and also the people that live in the neighborhood. And now that kid goes to that preschool. He's three years old. Just a miracle story. You've said, um, and you're talking about this right here. You know, we started this part of the conversation talking about capitalism. You said you're part capitalist, part social worker. Yeah. You know, you got to make money to do all this stuff. You got to make money, and, you, and capitalism provides jobs for all these people. Provides jobs for all these people. You say, guy right back there. He's a great salesman. He spent 10 years in the federal penitentiary. And he, he, you know, he, he learned the hard way. He learned the work ethic. I got another guy who spent 10 years in Angola penitentiary, the roughest state-run penitentiary in the country and in Louisiana. Both of them got great work ethics from being in there and they appreciate being out and they do a great job. So, you know, uh, if not for my troubles, I would not know my strengths. There's so many of our kids today that think that business and capitalism is fundamentally evil and that it's fundamentally about exploitation. Um, and when you turn on an air condition every night, you figure out uh, who put that there. And if you turn, you, you know, you like your cell phone, figure out how, how that get there. And you like your car and you like uh, all these nice things, capitalism and uh, free enterprise, they, they built this country and Last time I checked, all those people from those uh, socialist countries are dying to get in here. It wasn't the other way around. There's not a massive out-migration. That's true. I mean, we've got 
I think I heard that something like seven million people have come into the country uh -huh. just in the. Uh -huh. They're coming for opportunity. God bless them. They're coming for opportunity. They're coming for a chance. They, that they're not coming here to be to become welfare recipients and wards of the state. They're coming here to have a chance at that you know that the that thing called the American dream, which still exists if you believe in it, you know, and and filling these kids' heads full of stuff of it. Uh, you're a victim, you're this, you're that. Well, uh, you, you know, uh, let, let's turn that V-I-C-T-I-M to V-I-C-T-O-R. Let, let's turn that victim into a victor. Let's be an example. How does it work together? How does your philanthropy and the, and the things you're talking about, the, the Work Texas, these programs you've built, how do they create, you know, my, my friend John Mackey says, you know, he calls himself a conscious capitalist, and that you mm -hmm. have stakeholders and the community's part of that and that it all works together like a system. Yeah, you know, the reason I started that trade school and that high school is in a five mile radius of this store, the average income is $26,000. So the, they ain't getting rich. And the problem is they have no skills, they have no education, and they're in, entwined in this vicious cycle of welfare recipients. And so if we can break that cycle and get mom or dad a good job that they love to do, we're gonna enrich their life. And uh, there's one lady that went to our welding class, and um, she was like fifth generation welfare. She broke the cycle. She's making hundred forty thousand dollars a year two years later. So, you know, we can do that for these people. You know, we, we we can do that. And capitalism is the ro the road to success, the road to the American dream. And the other thing that people don't realize the country we have denigrated work to the point of, you're a chump if you work. You're a chump if you work hard. If you, if you like, like my boy, the kid that I told you. Yeah. Uh, the 10 year old, man, his mom's a prostitute and it's a, it's a mess. And they're living in a hotel right now. I, you know, I heard him last night on the phone saying, uh, uh, I'm gonna lock the door. You, how do you live in a hotel, a seedy hotel when you're 10 years old? But anyway, he tells me every day, he says, Mr. Mack, he says, you're working too hard, 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 hard. Mr. Mack, he says, you got all these people in here, they ought to be doing the work, you ought to be having fun. Somebody taught that kid the wrong stuff. <laughs> they taught him the wrong stuff. You gotta get up, go to work, and make something out of your life. That's what Oral Roberts said, and it stuck with me my whole life. And he said, get up, go to work, and make something out of your life. You are, how, how old are you, Mac? 72 going on 18. <laughs> so you're 72. I understand that you work in this store every day. Yep, what else would I do? <laughs> you know, oh, work is life's greatest therapy. The people who don't work are robbed of the greatest joy in life, and that is the joy of work. And all these 18 years old, they're sitting in their home in their mother's basement playing video games, they are destroying their life. Do you know who uh, Temple Grandin is? I've interviewed Temple Grandin. I'm, hey, I'm, really? I'm a huge fan. We, we made a movie about the way animals are raised for food called uh, At the Fork, and there's a whole sequence with Temple Grandin. Really? Yeah, Temple Grandin like this. Uh, I, I introduced her at her birthday party last, this year. Oh my gosh, and, she's and, amazing. And so she's got a great big sign right there at Colorado State. It says, working with horses saved my life. Yeah. Because she was autistic, she is still autistic, Still has almost no social skills. The first time I went to see her, I have racehorses. I wanted her to consult me on these racehorses. And so I called her, and it took a while, and then we got this appointment for me to go see her. She said, I said, what day do you want me to come up with? She said, Sunday. I said, where are we going to meet? She says, Whataburger. And I think that's kind of strange. We're going to meet at Whataburger. So I fly all the way up there to Colorado Springs. I go to Whataburger. We're having a nice meeting for about 45 minutes. She looks and watches. She says, I got to go. She walks right out. That's Temple, right? <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. you know, yeah, work saved her life. Work, mucking horse stalls spurred her interest in animals. And now she's done more for animal husbandry than anybody in human history. Tell me work's not important. My little daughter, Elizabeth, started working with people like herself with OCD. Liz's OCD was so bad, when she got out of bed in the morning, she had to uh, lift her one leg out of bed and put it on the floor 42 times. And then lift her other leg out of bed 42 times. Because her mother at that time was 42 years old. But no, she had to do 42 sets times 42. So she'd be drenched in sweat before she took a shower for eight hours. Eight hours in the shower. Oh. Eight hours. Yeah, just absolutely paralyzed. Uh, totally. 
But then she started working, helping other people with mental illness, and it changed her life. And she'll always have that mental illness, but now she can cope with it because she learns. She's teaching other people to work saved her life. Work saved so many people's life. My other friend, uh, Yvonne Strait, she had a child 60 years ago with severe Down syndrome, right? Yeah. Back then, the uh, Down syndrome, life expectancy five years old. So they told her to put the child in a mental institution. Yvonne says, no, I'm not going to do that. So Yvonne searched everywhere to try to get somebody to make this child make a sound. Uh, she had Down syndrome because she got uh, encephalitis uh, when she was four or five years old and kind of mess extreme heat messed her brain up. But anyway... Bond kept searching until she found somebody who could, uh, this uh, PhD guy in Purdue University could make this child make a sound. And then Yvonne knew there was hope. And she st started the school with children with learning disabilities, Gall Briarwood, for three or four kids in her neighborhood. And now that 60 years later, the school is still going. She started the home for adults with learning disabilities where her child Vicky is at now. Vicky's in her 60s. And... At Briarwood, they have people with Down syndrome, uh, brain damage, all sorts of learning disabilities. Well, everybody at Briarwood has a full-time job. Everybody, including the paraplegics. And the yeah. paraplegics smile while the other people work. Their job is to smile all day long. And so during the pandemic, they wouldn't let them, the state of Texas wouldn't let them work because of close proximity. And so the residents were uh, going to revolt because they wanted to work, because work brought them so much joy. And so one of the uh, counselors came up with an idea, let's let them work outside, let them paint the windows of the cars. So they got them some washable paint, and the first thing they painted on the window of the car was, let me work. It's the funny. human instinct. It's funny because, um, well, first of all, the connections with you and Temple and, and what Temple experienced versus your daughter, that must have been something you really bonded over. Yeah. And I mean, Temple's, Temple's incredible. She's 75 years old, fully autistic, flies all over the world by herself, and has such an insight. And, you know, we got a lot of kids that work here with autism, work in our, our uh, restaurant, and, and they take pride in the job, and that, that's important to them. It doesn't matter if you make minimum wage or if you make $10 million a month like some basketball player. What matters is you take joy in your work. One of the things that all these stories to me have in common is that people don't know their own potential. Absolutely. Um, and I feel like, you know, you've got, when you talk about freedom, the way I think about it, is that we need freedom so that we can t go out there and figure out what we're capable of, because we don't even know, right? So somebody like Temple or your daughter, they're just told you, you, you got nothing. You can't do it. You give it up. Screw oh, you're, you're a victim you're, of circumstance. You, you know how to train a flea? No. Uh, no. No. I'll teach you. So, you know, I'm up in that tower over there, right? When you sleep in the tower, there's no bathroom, so you, know, you have to take a water bottle up there. <laughs> you got the rest of it. So you take a flea, a flea can jump about eight feet. You put him in one of those water bottles that doesn't have any water in it, and you put some food in the bottom, you cut a couple holes and hop so you can get some air, and you leave that flea in there all night long. And that flea can jump eight feet. So all night long he's jumping up, jumping up, jumping up, trying to get out, right? He can't get out. The next morning you take the lid off that, that flea will never jump out. <laughs> he's trained himself, he can't do that. We're right. flea training these people. We're flea training these human beings to say they can't do that and they believe it. And we're flea training with fifth, fifth generation welfare. The purpose of that school over there and that trade school I got and that elementary, I mean, that preschool is to say, you can do this. Don't listen to all this crap that says, tells you what you can't do. I'm here to tell you what you can do. You know, Michael Jordan got cut from his high school basketball team. Yeah. Yeah, it's a powerful message. It is. It's it's a message of life. Get out of that basement and go to work and make something out of your life. And if you fail, that's a great thing. Fail forward fast. I must fail 10 or 15 times before I get in this gig, you know. And my father failed a thousand times, but he never gave up, you know. How many times did Abraham Lincoln fail? What's the biggest... That noise in the background is the call to the post because I'm in the racehorse business. You know what? <laughs> you know I became a millionaire in the racehorse business. Is that right? Yeah, I started out as a billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about um, your philanthropy a little more. So you've got all these programs you've set up here for the people that you're interacting with, but mm. then you support so many other things in the community and around the country. What's your philosophy? Like, how do you decide 
what's worth getting behind. My philosophy used to be give away as much as you can. And I did that for 30 years. Things never got any better. So I've kind of changed that. I, I, I really think that when I saw that dirty job stuff and saw those plumbers and electricians making two or three hundred thousand dollars a year that Mike Rowe talked about, it, it really changed my perspective. Yeah. And you know what those jobs, those plumbers and electricians and sewer workers, those jobs can't be exported to China. You know, they're real jobs. And they're, they're like Temple said, work with your hands. And uh, my philosophy is changed because I've seen what happens here over the years. You know, it, it, my philosophy is now, it, let's, let's teach them how to fish. Let's not just give them a fish and feed them for a day, but let's teach them how to fish and help them find, find that job that makes them, where they can't wait to get out of bed in the morning, put their clothes on and go to work. And the other thing it does, being at work brings a sense of community. We have yeah. lost all sense of community in this country. In 1900, the average size of U.S. household was 10.5 people. 1900. Yes, yeah, so you, you had a bigger community in your house of than course. a lot of people have today. And the average size U.S. household today, less than two. And one's the loneliest number. One of these guys that works for me, his name's Charlie. He's 75 years old. He grew up in East Texas. They had 17 kids. <laughs> Do you think he learned some social skills? And he had a little, twin, uh, a little full-size bed. Him and his brother slept here. The other two brothers slept the other way, and there's four of them in the bed. They learned how to. They learned how to share. They learned how to survive. They learned how to thrive, and even though they had nothing. And he had. He got a work ethic when he was six years old. That changed his life working on that farm for forever. And what we have to do in this country is let people know that uh, it's okay to have nothing. It's not okay not to try. What and it's a, okay to fail forward fast. And the more you fail, the closer you're getting to something that's going to work. You know, what do you say to, to somebody? Obviously, it's hard to get to this point in our conversation and even raise this. But to, for those who say, oh, it's easy for you to say you're this, you've got a $200 million business and sure you failed. You know, oh, you're saying you had these failures, but all I'm seeing is nothing but successes. Well, you, you, you should have been here in 1981. I sent Linda down here for a month before I got here. I was up in Dallas selling furniture, trying to make a commission and get enough money so we could open this place. She came down here by herself. There was five abandoned model homes there. There was a bunch of, uh, back then you call them hobos, now they call them homeless people living in there. No plumbing, excrement everywhere. She cleaned that place up for four weeks till I got here. Many a time, we didn't know if we were gonna make payroll every Thursday afternoon, and thank God some, something would, we'd make some sales and make payroll, so. Uh, just when it's too tough for you boys, just about right for me. <laughs> That's it, you know? Tough times never last, tough people do. You gotta get used to it. And, and this life is a rose garden, excuse my expression, that's a bunch of bullshit. Life's hard, get used to it. Yeah, tell me about the hurricane. The hurricane, we're, we're, we're used to hurricanes in, in South Texas and, and the Gulf Coast area, so hurricane, uh, came in on, I guess it was, it was supposed to be in on Saturday, and Saturday was kind of a non-event. This was Harvey, right? Yeah, so I went home, and I live about 10 miles from here, and I got up Sunday morning to go to church, and I got out in the street, and there was like two feet of water, so I said, uh, to heck with that, I went back in the house, and weather forecast was only getting worse, so I decided to try to make it out here, so I Drove through the water getting here, and the water was two or three feet high. You got a good truck? Yeah, you know, I, I, got, <laughs> I had the good Lord, not the good truck. Yeah. But I got here, and uh, uh, my son James was stuck in Dallas. He does all the social media stuff. So I said, what should we do to let these people know that we've got these trucks and we'll rescue people and help them, and they can sleep here if they want to? And he said, you got to do a Facebook Live. I didn't know what Facebook Live was, but I did one. We got about three million views, and people started wading through the water to come in here and stay here, and we got volunteers. We didn't check any insurance, any driver's license. That. We just put people in the trucks, and they went out and rescued people, and we rescued people all day and all night for a couple of days. And, they had two or three hundred people sleeping here, and all these people were aghast that I would let these people in this furniture store and let them sleep on these fancy sofas and mattresses and this and that. I said, what, what am I going to do? Let my people drown? It's just so elementary. It's not hard. 
we got food, we got water, we got showers, we had power, so let them here. And they stayed here. They were, they were uh, uh, very well behaved. They kept their pets in the back room. It all worked out. It's community, you know, it's community. What would you say to somebody that says, you know, Mac, you're, you're a saintly capitalist, but most of your, most of your fellow businessmen don't do this kind of thing. Is that, you know, is that even true? I, I don't worry about what I can affect. I can't worry about some other person, what, what their lifestyle is or what they do. You know, it's, it's their business. But I know one thing, if they're making payroll, they're helping people put food on the table for their kids. They're, and they're making somebody feel good about having a job. You know, uh, one of the things we do for these young kids here, we have so many of them that are in jail, penitentiary, whatever, and they come here and they're scared to death. You know, their eyes are darting everywhere because they don't know what's next. And then all of a sudden, one of the best things we've ever done, we, we have free breakfast, free lunch, free dinner. I'm banging on the table again. Free breakfast, free lunch, free dinner for everybody in there. And because it brings a sense of community. And when you go in that lunch room, you can't bring your iPad or your computer. You, you got to actually turn it off and talk to somebody. Imagine that. That's your rule in the lunch room? Uh, uh, uh-huh. No, no iPads, no phones, even for customers. You got to actually talk to the person sitting next to you. So these kids are coming here scared to death. All of a sudden, they're sitting there talking to this guy next to them, and they find out they have similar interests. And then, they, and all of a sudden, they've got some friends here because there's no community. It used to be church. It used to be family, it used to be all those things. Now it's no more because they live by themselves. They live with one person, their, their mom, and they don't go to church. They don't have those, those things that tie us together like we used to. But all of a sudden, if they got four or five friends at work, then when their car breaks down, they're going to find a way to get to work because they don't want to let down their friends. Or if they got a problem, somebody at the table had that problem before can tell them how to solve the problem. And all of a sudden, they have a network of people and their life changes. That's what work brings for people. Not just economic benefit, but social benefit and, and a feeling of well-being and, and uh, a job well done. Whether they're cleaning the toilets down here, wiping the floors, best salesman, best delivery guy, it doesn't matter. They're part of something bigger than this. When my son, uh, uh, he goes to a school up in Austin called Acton, and uh, they do internships. So he's been he's been working for companies since he was in middle school. Well, good for him. And uh, last summer he worked at the local public works, you know, out in the hundred degree heat for eight hours, and he's a little stoic. And so we said, well, Mateo, what do you think? And how do you like this? He's like, well, the work's pretty hard. But I, I'm working with a couple guys I really like, so it's actually really fun. Like, I don't even, it, the time flies by because we're talking about World of Warcraft and rap music and all their interests that they have. And meanwhile, they're like cutting down agave trees with a machete in 100 degree Texas heat. Good for them. Yes. That's it. You know, work's life's greatest therapy. And the people that are job, robbed of the joy of work, well, that's the worst thing we can do for them. You know, somebody told me the other day that, uh, I don't know that I agree with this, but it was an interesting statement. Uh, Work without pay is slavery. Uh, pay without work is slavery. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's right. That, there, there's a lot of truth in it's that. It's the joy of work. The, I accomplished this. And again, the, these kids say, I don't like my first job and I'm a failure. You're not a failure. You just fail forward fast. I fail 50 times till you find something you like. Then once you find something you like, it's all, it's all history. Forget about all those failures. You talked at the beginning of our conversation about being raised in a Catholic family and seeing that with your, your, your mother and your father, that they instilled that in you yeah. in their actions. What role does your faith play in all of this work you do be, in the community? Well, it's huge. You know, faith sustains me. You know, there's a lot of dark hours being an entrepreneur. There's a lot of failure, a lot of, uh, a lot of this, a lot of that, and a lot of, there's a lot of darkness in this world, you know, like my... Uh, my boys that were here yesterday. There's a lot. There's darkness in their world, so faith sustains me that it, uh, no matter what happens, uh, things will get better. Keep swinging. You know, it's like I was in Atlanta two years ago, and the Astros played Atlanta, and lost in the World Series, and there was a big statue there of Hank Aaron, and he said, uh, "No matter how bad a slump I was in, no matter how bad my personal life was, no matter how many problems I had, I always did one thing. I kept swinging." Do you think you'll uh, you'll you'll work until your last breath? It, it, it doesn't seem. I mean, it doesn't seem like you you you're the retiring type. Uh, people ask me all the time when I'm gonna retire. I'm gonna retire right at the front desk, and I'm gonna die right there, and I'm gonna die happy. 
It is funny because I, I, I've heard this. I don't know if, if, this, if it's statistically true or what. The people, they, they leave work and they think, oh, I'm going to have this retirement. And it cuts their life short. They don't survive. Why do you think we have this idea that, oh, I want to go into retirement and Human stop? beings were made to live, work, play, and die in groups. Live, work, play, and die in groups. You've worked, your life has to have purpose and meaning. That's what uh, life is all about. And somebody retires and they take care of their grandkids or they, they're involved in the church activities, the community activities, and their life goes on. They go retire and... To, to my way of thinking, anecdotally, you go home and watch television all day long and life's over. So as long as you're involved and active in something, then life has purpose and meaning. That's why I'm such a big advocate of work is because it brings purpose and meaning to life. And these people that are unfortunately sitting at home unemployed, feeling for sorry for themselves, their life has no purpose and no meaning and they're robbed of the joy of life. You know, this kid that works for me says, in Mexico, there's a lot of problems in Mexico, but you gotta work to eat. Something to be said for that. There is something going on in this country, and I think maybe in the West more generally, right? There's a sense that, like, people, there's a lot of people that talk about this, that there's like a, a purpose void. Yeah, there is. You yeah. Know, what do the, you think is driving that? What, you know? I think a lot of it has to do with lack of religion. You know, religion was central point for 5,000 years, Judeo Christian, at least in the Western society, and now. Very few people go to church. What's, what's the purpose other than having a good time and getting uh, uh, one pleasure after the next? And pretty soon those wear out. You know, but work brings purpose and meaning to life, and so does community, and so does church. So I think those things have to be reexamined. There's something there. You're a grandfather now. Mm -hmm. How has that, what, what's been the biggest surprise about becoming a grandfather? You know, the joy those kids bring me and, and uh, my... Uh, uh, grandchild texts me all the time, so you know they're they're great kids and just uh, another uh, another generation. And hopefully, I can teach. Uh, I'd like to be remembered as somebody who taught them how to work. My grandfather, on my uh, mother's side, uh, taught me a work ethic. He worked till he was 90 years old. Whenever he died, so uh, my father's uh, father died before I was born, so I never knew knew him, but. The whole idea is uh, teach them that the greatest joy in life comes from the joy of work. That's what I want to teach them. All right. So we've, you've referenced that you're climbing up in this tower every day. So just lay that out for the viewer that doesn't know the full story. You know, I'm a promoter. And when I was in high school, way back in Dallas many years ago, this local radio station had this guy sit on top of a flagpole for months. And that was difficult. They had a basket up there for him or something. So... We want to sell a bunch of mattresses during the uh, baseball season, so uh, I said we're going to sell a thousand mattresses before I come down off that tower. We have a tower out there that's about 100 feet tall. You know, I climb up this ladder to get there, and um, so I climb up there every night and sleep on top of that tower, and it's been quite an experience. The uh, What I didn't expect, I've got a tent up there, and it's got a little air conditioning, so the humidity's the heat and humidity is not too bad because the wind blows through that tent all night, but the sound from the highway is just deafening. So that's been fun. Well, first of all, you've got like a 12-foot ladder that then you've got to grab, like you got to get up there and then grab, and then I saw, I was looking up, that, yeah. you know, yeah, there's like 100 feet. It, yeah. So it's, it, it's, it's a promotion. <laughs> yeah. I'm a promoter, you know. Like I told you, I learned how to sell uh, furniture from watching Art Grendel sell cars many years ago. So... Uh, you know, one of my mottos is, when in doubt, go back to square one and promote. People talk to me all the time at the Astros game. How'd you get out of the tower? I said, they let me out during the day. At night, I got to be up there. What do you have to say to the people who, who, are, who are out there saying that every kid needs to go to college? College, college can have value, but there's so, there's so many opportunities that seem like are getting overlooked. Ask Temple Grandin. Ask Temple Grandin that question. She'll tell you in a New York minute that ain't true. People need to learn... You know, you used to have jobs and shop in high school and work with your hands. What, what's wrong with that? You know, and, and all these incredible uh, good, good paying jobs. Uh, yes, college is great for some people, some it's not. Everybody doesn't have to go to college. My friend Mike Feinberg, who uh, works here with me at Work Texas and at the Premier High School, he started KIPP schools that uh, the idea was a college prep. Yeah, and even in there, and Kip School at one time had 500 high schools across the country. Even at their peak time, uh, only 50% of the kids that 
graduated from KIPP were graduating college. So the other 50% didn't, and they had all the student debt, and what good is all that? And they didn't have a, a skilled trade to fall back on. So I think there's a lot of ways to be successful. Uh, yeah, college is great for some, for all, no. Work is great for everybody, as far as I'm concerned. If you don't believe that, go to Brookwood and see those people work. Uh, my final story at Brookwood, Yvonne and them uh, take in those adults with severe learning disabilities. They had this high-powered business executive got in a severe motorcycle accident and brain damage. So he's at Brookwood. And they tried to get him to do all these menial, repetitive jobs that they do at Brookwood, and he refused to do any of them for months. So finally they found a job he liked to do, and he was good at it. So one day Yvonne, who's 95 years old, sitting in her office at the end of this long hallway, and she sees this grown man, this business guy who had this brain trauma, come running down the hallway with a piece of paper in his hand. And he's running full steam, and he busts in her door, and she didn't know what was happening. He's shaking this piece of paper in his hand. She said, John, 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 what's the problem? What's the problem? He said, Miss Straight, Miss Straight, look what I got, look what I got, look what I got. He says, what'd you get, John? He said, I got a paycheck, I got a paycheck, I got a paycheck. I'm a real person now. And this is somebody who was successful all their life, mm -hmm. or built, built success for themselves. Huge, himself. hugely successful. I, um, a friend of mine, Arthur Brooks, says that you got to earn your success. That, you know, you talked about that teaching that fleet. That, mm, and, mm. That, and that, that what, what you were describing, that that fleet will learn not to jump out of the bottle, and then even if you cap it, they, they'll stay in the bottle, yeah. that that's a learned helplessness. Mm, mm. And then so he, he said, you know, we need to, the opposite of that is earned success. I feel like that's what this whole conversation yeah, has been Yeah, and it's about. like those kids that I'm mentoring, uh, they, they actually tell me that I'm working too hard. And they tell me that I'm a manager, and I should sit on my ass, and I should sleep all day and let somebody else do it. That's what they've been taught. It's learned helplessness. We gotta turn that around and tell them that uh, find a job you love to do and you'll never have to work a day in your life because you look forward to getting up and getting dressed and going to work in the morning brings purpose and meaning to life. It's not about how much money you make, it's about how much of a difference you make. I've got a couple final questions for us before uh, sure. the doors open in, in this store. No problem. And uh, this has been a lot of fun so far. So we like to, when we have time, we like to ask a couple of the same questions of our guests. So let's start it off. Sure. Okay. So first question. When you competed against your dad, did he let you win or did you have to earn it? I probably know the answer, but I want to hear it. <laughs> he helped me. You know, he, he, didn't, he didn't want to beat me. He, he wanted, we'd play golf and probably their son golf tournaments or whatever. He was all, always helping, you know, just that was who he was. Oh, so he wasn't the hard line. I'm going to... Swing as hard as I can, and you're gonna learn the hard way, son. No, no. he was he was very uh, nurturing. <laughs> That's great. These days, this is an important one. What does masculinity mean to you? Like, what is it? I would think uh, it would mean. I mean, you've got I mean, a to son. me. It means go, uh, try, try. Don't give up, you know, and uh, don't be afraid to cry, but also don't be afraid to be strong in the face of all or all, all sorts of adversity, because. You know, adversity is going to come your way. You just got to stand up and fight. You know, if not for my struggles, I would not know my strength. I think that's uh, cuts either way, male or female. But it means standing up, and trying, and 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 never, ever, ever giving up. You know, uh, or as Mark Twain once said, uh, uh, ninety-five percent of life showing up. You got to show up. Kind of related. Um, you know, you you had you had a first son. Do you remember? Any lessons you gave him about what it meant to be a man? Probably just actions, you know, uh, getting up, going for work, being uh, uh, loyal and good to his mother and those type of things. If you could relive one memory with your dad, which day would it be? What would it be? Boy, that's a good question. Probably one of my high school football games my brother and I were playing, and he was right there with us. He was like... You know, it's like he was, he wanted us to play more than we wanted to play. He loved it, and uh, he, he was as great football fans. That would be that. Oh, that's great. Did he did he push you to play? Did you did you want to quit? But you're I coming? wanted to play, but oh, I, I, I never wanted to quit. But he he loved uh, football. He loved competition. He, he was he was a man's man, you might say. <laughs> All right. What's the most valuable thing you've learned from your children? 
don't give up. Common um, theme. You know, all three of them. All th uh, you know, my three biologicals, and all three of them have had problems in their life, and they're they're hanging tough like their mother, and uh, they're hanging in there, and and they learn that. Uh, a lot of that from their mother, who really raised them while I was working in the business. So don't give up and uh, just keep the faith, no matter how bad it gets. We talked about this a little bit, but what did your dad teach you about God? That God's omnipresent and God has a plan for us and God is not gonna let you fail. And then uh, if you uh, do the right thing long enough, good things will happen to you. You've t talked about uh, several people in this conversation that I imagine came to you and said, Mac, how could there be a God with what's going on in my life? That 10 year old boy living in a motel, his mother's a prostitute, and he hears you talking, saying something about God. I mean, what do, you, what do you say to those people that you encounter that, are, that it just feels like God has abandoned them? God gives us all struggles. That's part of, the, part of life, struggles, no matter if you're uh, uh, two years old, 10 years old, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, there's gonna be struggles and that's part of life, you know. Uh, you, gotta, you gotta go through it, you gotta suit up and you gotta put your big boy, big girl britches on, you gotta keep playing. And that's, that's part of life is learning that I can get through this struggle. And if not for this struggle, I would not know my strength. You just gotta keep going through it because it's gonna be there every day. Every day is gonna be a battle and a blessing. All right, last of these, what do you want to be remembered by? What do you want on your tombstone, so to speak? You know, at the end of the day, it's not about making money, it's about making a difference. So hopefully I made a difference. You know, hopefully I made a difference in, in this world. I go to those Astro games and uh, I'm in the uh, concourse for four hours taking pictures. I don't ever sit down and a lot of people tell me that when I talk to their high school, it changed their life or this or that. So that, that to me is what it's all about, trying to make a difference and trying to have uh, people say, if he can do it, I can do it. That's the whole idea. If he can do it and I got nothing, I can do it. Because he ain't the smartest guy in the world, he just worked harder. What challenges your patience the most? And how do you overcome it? You, you, you're clearly a man with patience. We've talked a lot about overcoming struggle, but what, what gets you? Oh, when well, business is slow, it drives me crazy, you know? I, I like to be busy, and uh, you know, I, I hate to say it, but I thrive on chaos. The more chaotic it is, the better I am. And so if it's, a, if it's really a busy day, or the Astros are in the World Series, and there's 10 million people here, it's great, because I love to be busy. busy. I can't stand a quiet Tuesday afternoon. Is there anything that we haven't had a chance to talk about that you would want to share with, uh, with our audience? Share the fact that the American dream still exists and those, those people who don't believe in it, uh, go find a job you love to do and you'll change your life forever. Get off the video games, get out of the basement, get off the uh, World Wide Web and go uh, change your life through the joy of work. That's what Yvonne taught me, that's what Temple Grandin taught me, that's what my parents taught me. My last question from every, every Dad Saves America interview is the same. And it's, you know, we, we call this Dad Saves America because I believe that as a, as a man in particular, you know, being a dad is something you can do that ripples out. It starts with your family, ripples to the community, and ultimately to the country. And it's something we can actually do it for our lives that has an impact. How do you see your role in the American story? My role is somebody who, who works in tries to uh, employ people and tries to let people know that uh, work is life's greatest therapy. That's my life's message. Go to work and make something out of your life. That, when that preacher told me that, what was it, 44 years ago, get up, go to work and make something out of your life. That's my message. And that's, you know, I'm sticking to it. Maybe they'll put that on my tombstone. <laughs> Mac, thank you for being on Dad Saves America. It's been a real pleasure. Love, love, the, love the show. Thank you, great interview. Thank you very much. You bet.